right, in section 5.2 today, we're going to look at angles of triangles. Start off, let's take a look at our first term, which is about corresponding parts. So if I have two triangles right here, and magically I do, I've got, let's go ahead, let me label this triangle A, B, C, the triangle on the right, I'll put as D, E, F. Okay, so we have these two triangles here. And remember, if I want to, let's go ahead, I'll put triangle A, B, C, just congruent to triangle, or let's just put triangle D, E, F. We don't even need to know that they're uh, congruent. Now, when I write statements here, for example, something like this, oh, let's put congruent, okay? I know that certain parts correspond with each other because of the placement of where the letters are, not necessarily on the triangle, because the triangle could be rotated or it could be flipped. When I'm talking about the location of the letters, I'm talking about the statement right here, okay? So if I look at this statement, I know, right? A is in the first position right here, D is in the first position, so triangle or angle A and angle D are congruent. I could say that angle B and angle E are congruent. They are both in the middle position, and then angle C and angle F are congruent as well. So I know based off of looking at this statement which angles are congruent because of how the uh, where the letters are written in the order. So when you write a statement today, it is absolutely important that you make sure that you have the letters written in a particular order. It can't just be any random order. It has to be very specific so that when you write a congruent statement, it makes logical sense. So I know what angles are congruent. I could also figure out what sides are congruent because if you take a look at the first two letters, A and B, the second two, uh, first two letters in the second triangle, DE, that tells me that AB is congruent to DE. So we can go ahead and put that right here, AB, DE. I could say that BC right here is congruent to EF. And since it's not isosceles, or sorry, um, equilateral, then I must put another marking there. And then that tells me that AC, and I'll use three hash marks, is congruent to DF. All right. So corresponding parts are parts that are uh, match, I guess you could say, the other triangle. And how do I know whether certain uh, parts of the triangle match each other? Well, one, they might have you, they might put markings on it. But if they give you a congruent statement right here, like I had, that will tell you which angles and sides are congruent, without a doubt. Let's take a look next at theorem 5.3. So these uh, theorems right here, or properties, we've used them in, in regards to angles and sides already. Well, we can now apply them to triangles. The first one right here is the reflexive property. It says for any triangle, triangle ABC, triangle ABC is congruent to triangle ABC. Remember, reflexive property, think of a reflection. It's the same on both sides. Symmetric. This is where we flip the statement. It starts off with if triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DEF, then triangle DEF is congruent to triangle ABC. And then the transitive property is where we try to make a connection where we say A is equal to B, B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. Right, so let's put that together right here in this triangle. If triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DEF, that's A is equal to B. And triangle DEF is congruent to triangle JLK. DEF shows up again, so we'll go ahead and put B is equal to C. Then in the end, we make this connection that 
A is equal to C, or triangle ABC is also congruent to triangle JKL. So we use these properties of congruence to prove two triangles to are congruent. So that we will be using that quite a bit later on. Next up, theorem 5.4, we have the third angles theorem. It says if two angles of one triangle are congruent to two angles of another triangle, then the third angles are congruent. So if they're saying, if you look at the diagram, it says angle A is congruent to angle D and angle B is congruent to angle E. Well, if those two angles are equal to each other in both triangles, then angle C and angle F are going to be congruent to each other as well, is what they're saying. Think about it this way. If I have that angle A is 30, and I have angle B is, let's put as 120. Angle D is going to be 30. Angle E is 120. Right, and 30 plus 120 is, or actually, we'll make this look, we'll change that up. Instead of 120, let's put 130. No, sorry. Uh, 30. Let's keep it at 120. So this is 120. This is 120. And so that means that angle C right here is going to be congruent to angle F. And let's see if it makes sense mathematically. All right, 120 plus 30 is uh, 150. And then so this angle C happens to be 30. If 30 plus 120 is 150, angle C has to be also 30. And there you have it right there we use our third angle theorem. Now, if you look at the diagram, angle C and angle A aren't supposed to be congruent. So that was my fault. I should have went back. Um, it would probably make more sense. Let's change this to 130. That will be better. Because if this is 130 plus 30, that gets me 160. That means angle C is 20. And right here, angle F is also 20. And so all three angles are different. All right. Let's go ahead and move on and take a look at our extra practice. So once again, on a problem like this, make sure you read it carefully because it says identify all pairs of congruent uh, corresponding parts then write another congruent statement for the polygons. So or the congruent statement for the polygons is similar to that of what we've been writing. Triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DEF. We've got to make sure that the sides all line up so that we can write that congruence statement. Okay? So let's take a look at number one. So we've got triangle PQR is congruent to triangle STU. So identify all pairs of con uh, corresponding parts. And right here, I can go ahead and say, first off, that angle P is congruent to angle S. And it should be, right? They're both in the first position of each statement. And they should correspond to our diagram. P has three hash marks right here. S has three hash marks, so I know that they are congruent. Angle Q, okay, it's another one. We have angle Q is congruent to angle T. And if I look at the diagram to help justify, they both have the two hash marks at Q and T, so I know that they are congruent. And that leaves that angle R is congruent to angle U. And they both should have a single hash mark, and they both do. Okay, so we have a pair of congruent parts. Now, if I look at the diagram, they don't give me much more uh, as far as their sides. But because we do have a congruent statement right here, I do know 
that angle, or sorry, segment PQ is congruent to segment ST. And how do I know that? Remember, look at the position. PQ is the first two, ST is also the first two in the second statement. I have QR that is congruent to TU. And then the last one, PR, is congruent to SU. So now we have written our uh, all the congruent parts. And we're saying, well, how could I write another statement? Well, it's pretty easy. How about we go ahead and just reverse the order? So write another congruent statement. I could use some of the properties we've learned. Or I can just go ahead and say triangle RQP is congruent to triangle UTS. And then we just reverse the order right there. And there we have it. Another congruent statement for the polygons. I could have said triangle STU. Okay, we could use the symmetric property. And I could have also said triangle STU is congruent to triangle PQR. All right, and that works as well. So there you go. Just showed you. Uh, we wrote down all the congruent parts, all the congruent, so all the angles and sides, and then we came up with another congruent statement. All right, so number two should be pretty straightforward. So we're going to go ahead and move on from that and take a look at number three. Numbers three and four, good questions here. All right. So we want to find the values of x and y. All right. Let's do that. So how we could justify certain things. You say, well, we got numbers and letters and all things in certain parts. Well, First off, I'm looking at the diagram and I see Y right here, angle Y. And I look at angle Y and that is in the middle of the statement. Well, let me look at the middle of the second statement, triangle RST, and S happens to be in the middle. Fantastic, because what that tells me right here is that angle Y is congruent to angle S. And if angle Y is 2X minus 20, I can go ahead and set that equal to 30 and then that allows me to solve for x. So let's put it all together. 2x is equal to 50. x is equal to 25. Fantastic. So then let's go ahead and take a look at the sides. we got to figure out right here, they give me x to z. Okay? And they also give me S to T. Now it says that they're supposed to be congruent. If I look up at the dot top right here at our congruent statement, X, Z is the first and last term. R and T is first and last as well. But then that's not RT, but it's okay. Because remember, RT is congruent to ST. So I can make this connection right here. For example, transitive property to justify the fact that I can say that XZ is congruent to ST. All right, and that's where the transitive property is important. In this problem, we have ourselves two our isosceles triangles. And they're all supposed to, sides are the same because of that hash mark. So now let's go ahead and solve things out. XZ is 15, and we'll set that equal to 3Y plus 9. So let's go ahead and solve things out. The 6 is equal to 3y, and y is equal to 2. There we go. You put everything together. Gotta love these properties, right? It's all coming together. Let's take a look at number 4 next. We've got these two quadrilaterals. Let's see what we can figure out here. I see right here an angle G. Angle G is in the third position. Angle C right here is in the third position of this other similarities or congruent statement. 
Well, that will allow me to go ahead and put 8y minus 3x. That's equal to 62. All right. Next up, while we have angle A, I don't want to solve it quite yet because I look right here and I have two variables. Okay, so there's probably something that's going to have to go on. I look at angle A, that starts, that's the first letter right there. Angle E is the first letter of the second statement. Well, that, that means that angle A and angle E right here should be congruent. So let's go ahead and take 60 plus 8x, and that's equal to 108. Let's go ahead and put things together. Right here, we'll go ahead and subtract 60 to both sides. Uh, that means that we have ourselves 48. Divide both sides by 8, and x is equal to 6. All right, so the reason why I did this first right here is because, remember, we have two variables. I can now substitute x with the 6 and now solve for y. So 8y minus 3 times 6 is equal to 62. So we have 8y minus 18 is equal to 62. And then let's solve things out right here. 8y is equal to, we'll add 18 to both sides. End up with 80. Divide both sides by 8. And y is equal to 10. And there you go. We now solve for both x and y right here. Let's move on. Next up. In exercise 5 and 6, we want to show that the polygons are congruent and explain your reasoning. And I put right there in red, all sides and angles must correspond and be congruent in order for us to justify this. All right. So. Let's start off. I've got angle A we have is congruent to angle C. Okay, good. But then I have these two angles right here. I know that are congruent. They're both 90 degrees. But what I don't know is angle A, B, and D and angle A, C, and D to be congruent. Don't have that type of information. Well, we could say that. I think one of the things that we could say to justify is we have our uh, third angle, right? One of the things that we had mentioned is the third angle theorem. If two angles in one triangle is congruent to two angles in another, then we can use that third angle theorem. So that's one way to prove that the polygons are congruent. We could also probably use it by its sides. Okay, and that one might be a little bit easier. Okay, because think about this. If I have AB, that right there, segment AB is congruent to segment CB. Right, we have it right here with the markings. Let's go ahead and put right here next up another pair of congruent sides. We have AD is congruent to CD right, by the markings. <clears throat> now, there's one thing that you're going to use quite a bit in the future in this chapter. Well, I have to prove that a third side is congruent to each other. That third side happens to be this one right here, D to B. I'm going to go ahead and say DB is congruent to DB. Because both triangles have that same side. Well, when something is congruent to each other and it's the same thing, you're going to use the reflexive property to justify that. Okay, reflexive property to justify that, and therefore we can go ahead and prove. All right, we have three sides of each triangle could be congruent. I can go ahead and write myself my triangle similarity statement. I could say, uh, let's say triangle B D A is congruent to triangle B D C. Remember, the order is absolutely important in when you write this out, okay? Because the angles and sides must correspond with each other based off of how you write 
the statement. We could also say right here, I could say triangle A, D, B is congruent to triangle C, D, B. That works just fine. Okay. So just make sure that the sides and the angles correspond and they are in the right position when you write your statements here. Okay. So that's how we can go ahead and justify and explain our reasoning right here. I showed that we have three sides that are congruent in each triangle. I also justified that the third side is congruent because of the reflexive property. And that right there, like I said, is something that you're going to use in a lot of your proofs later on. Let's go ahead and take a look at the last part. And let's take a look at number 7 and 8. They're asking you to find the measure of angle 1. Let's see if you can go ahead and do that right here. Give you some time to look at that. So, any ideas what to do? What I would say and recommend is let's take a look at one of our triangles. Let's split it apart. The one on the left, or the sorry, the one on the right. If this is angle D, and that's 33 degrees right here, okay, and we have angle C, which happens to be 90, then what I can do is figure out this angle this missing piece. That missing piece right there happens to be, well, let's find that. Um, remember, this is 90 degrees and we have a third angle theorem. I can go ahead and say that uh, angle, so 90 plus 33 plus, we'll just go ahead and say X for that missing angle is equal to 180. And so when I go ahead and solve that out right here, X ends up equaling Let's go ahead and it ends up being 57. All right. So let's look at the other triangle going the other direction. Right? We have triangle A, B, C. A is 33 as well. It shows us in the diagram that we have congruent parts. That's 90 degrees. And then think about it. That means that this angle right here should be exactly the same thing as what we just found right there of 57. Okay. <clears throat> so this angle right here, we just figured out, is also 57 degrees. So if that angle is 57 degrees, and the whole thing right here is 90, can I not take 57 plus we'll say angle Y, or we'll actually, since we're finding angle one, let's go ahead and put that as angle one is equal to 90. Angle one is equal to 33 degrees. Just like that, all right? So there's number seven. You gotta be a little more creative. You might have to break things apart and separate them in order to help you figure out the answer. Let's take a look next at number eight. All right, so we've got some angles here. We've got some sides that they say is congruent. Let's figure things out. Well, I could see first off that this angle right here that has the 54, it's going to be congruent to another angle. So this right here is 54. I will know that this angle is also 54. You've got to be able to justify those things in this chapter. The reason why, we have vertical angles. And remember, vertical angles are congruent. So that's why I'm recalling some of this stuff to help you out, guys. So that one's 54. We have another 54. All right, let's see. What else can I say? I've got 
two pairs of sides that are congruent, x, v, and w, v. Great. So how about this? Now that I know what this angle is and how it's congruent to this, and then we also have two angles that are also u and x to be congruent. Well, in this triangle right here, T, U, V, can I figure out what angle U is? Angle U is equal to all three angles combined, right? The third angle theorem. So let's go ahead, angle U, and let's put right here, plus 80 plus 54 is equal to 180. So angle U is now equal to, you do a little calculation there, looks like it is going to be 46. If angle U and angle X are congruent, then that means that angle X is also equal to 46. And there you go. We now found angle 1. All right, so... On some of these problems, make sure you guys split things apart. Look for the congruent sides and angles, and that will help you solve things right here. And we now just finished section 5.2, congruent polygons. And if you saw in the beginning that it said 5.1, it did. I forgot to change it. So this is section 5.2, congruent polygons.